Hi there, Glocal Citizens. Welcome back to the podcast that inspires a borderless mindset around manifesting a new world. I am your host, Florence Adu. I'm coming to you from my summer sojourn here in the U.S. I'm in Brooklyn, busying myself with the work of building charter schools. So you'll hear a little bit about those kinds of stories in the coming months as I chat with my guests about what they're doing globally. And my guest is co-founder and president of the Inclusion Design Group, where she is also head trainer and responsible for the creation of the dynamic set of workshops and follow-up activities used by her team. Her experiential training models cut through diversity fatigue and allow participants to engage in deep, authentic, and meaningful dialogues. Among her prior positions, she served as the Assistant Vice Provost, Assistant Dean, and Director of the Diversity and First Generation Office at Stanford University, where she introduced groundbreaking work on authentic engagement, intergroup dialogue, and unconscious bias to over 30,000 students, staff, faculty, and alumni. She also taught several courses at Stanford, including Intergroup Communications, also known as Group Com, with the renowned cultural psychologist Hazel Marcus. For over 25 years, she has consulted with a wide variety of corporate, educational, not-for-profit, and community-based groups to facilitate uncommon conversations on issues of race, gender, class, and social justice. Tarika Blackman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Florence. It's so good to be here with you and your global community. Excited to participate in the conversation. Wonderful. So let's get started. Where are you from? Where are you local? And what is your craft? Oh, thank you so much. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. As anyone who knows me knows, it's a big, big part of my identity. I lived in Northern California and primarily in Oakland for about 25 years. And for the last 18 months, I have lived in the U.S. Virgin Islands in St. Thomas, which has been an incredible joy. Oh, wow. Yeah. So tell me the, what was the second part of the question? It is, what is your craft? Oh, I love this question because I don't always think about what I do in those terms. And so lately I've been thinking about it a lot because my worlds are converging from all the different things that I do. And so I definitely feel like it is my ability to inspire, facilitate and build communities, movements through the way that I speak, the way that I'm able to translate big ideas or problems into a language and sort of bridge building that people from different backgrounds, different communities, people who want to build something together, including and especially bridges across their differences. I really think that that's the work I do. And it's been important because I spent 19 years, almost 20 really, working in youth development. And then I all along have been very involved in social justice. Social justice actually led me to ministerial school. And so I still preach um, pretty regularly. And youth development led me into diversity and inclusion education, which is my primary profession at the moment. And so everything kind of converges in this moment. And I'm doing more speaking that's open to the public, that has a spiritual activism uh, specialty around this diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity work. So Mm. that was a big answer, Mm -hmm. um, but it's really all about, you know, sort of how I got to understanding what my particular gift is to the world. Right, right, right. So I'm curious about, like you said, it's a big, big, big answer. So I'm curious about how you mentioned that it was your youth development that led you into the ministerial study and work. So tell us more about that. Like, what about it? Like, how did that come about? Yeah. So um, I worked in youth development since I was in high school. And over time, I did arts and community development. I did work that was specific to girls. And then I got into working with Black youth specifically in Oakland. And in that time, I worked with a lot of youth who had experienced trauma. So I worked with sexually exploited girls. I worked in juvenile detention facilities. I worked with youth that were queer and homeless. So the intersection of a lot of things. I also worked with, you know, Black communities who really wanted their children to have a clear sense of their own culture, history, and identity. And in that work, 
I started out working directly with the students. And over time, I started training schools and I tried, started training nonprofit staff. Then the next level was training leaders and training people in city government and then ultimately foundation principals and executives. And what I found is the higher I got up the ladder, the more I had to explain just basic identity principles around mm. what it is to be low income, what it is to be queer, what it is to be black. Um, because people didn't, under, if you don't understand racism, you can't serve black kids. Mm. The, the mm -hmm. organization that I ran for six years, Leadership Excellence, also had a very explicit social justice uh, component. They're now called Flourish Agenda. And so in that, I'm talking to leaders, explaining to them why social justice is important. When I left that job, within six months, Oscar Grant was killed in Oakland. And I became one of the architects of that movement. And so I was very, very involved in the leadership. And at a certain point, I began to raise the question of the tactics that we were using. And if some of those tactics really co-created the world we didn't want. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a crisis point for me where some folks threw red paint on a woman from the BART board and they said, the blood is on your hands. And at that moment, I knew that these weren't tactics that were a part of my mission. And so I went to ministerial school because I had always been unapologetically black centered, but I wanted to be unapologetically spiritually centered. And I began to practice what I call spiritual activism. And it is an activism that is firmly rooted in the vision and the goal. So if you don't have an idea of what peace is to you, of what justice mm -hmm. is to you, of how love intersects in your practice, right, then it's it's hard for you to actually practice real revolution. And, and even, you know, Asada Shakur says the goal of revolution is peace. Yeah. And certainly we have to use other tactics, but we can't forget that that's what the goal is. Angela Davis was working on prison abolition. And when we called for the imprisonment of some of the officers, some people from the abolitionist movement pushed back on us and they said, we can't support prison for anyone. And that was just a radicalizing moment for me. So I went to ministerial school, became a minister and started with this thing that one of my teachers, Reverend Deborah Johnson, called the fire triangle. And it's the acknowledgement that every fire needs uh, heat, fuel and oxygen, that heat is our often our anger. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't apologize for that anger. It's the catalyst. It's the, you know, uh, there was a march that I led. And at the end of it, the anarchists started burning cars. And I was initially really upset about it. And I condemned it. And one of them sat and talked to me at one point, And they said, let me tell you something. If we hadn't burnt up cars, you would have never been on CNN. And that made me really sad because I knew it was true. When people say, well, why are you so upset about this when you're not upset about, you know, black on black violence? And I was like, this is not true. We have been having gang truces and peace marches for in all the 20 years that I worked in Oakland. But there was no coverage. Mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. There was never coverage. No one right. came. No one cared that we have been doing that work in our community that whole time. But when people, anarchists burned up cars, then everybody brought their cameras and their microphones. And that made me sad. But I began to understand that anger is a part of social change. And it always has been, mm -hmm. you know, Stonewall riots, whatever it is, it's a catalyst, but it's not sustainable. And that's where we need the fuel. And that has to do with self-care for activists. It has to do with community building. It has to do with resources. But a friend of mine likes to say Martin Luther King had a dream, not a complaint. And he wasn't just trying to get off the back of the bus. He was trying. His vision was black children and white children holding hands. And that was an impossibility during his time. And so that oxygen we refer to as the vision. Right. Like what is something further off in the distance? And so that is a very long answer to how I got into how I started a youth development and got into spiritual activism. That's so, so interesting. Just the experiences that you've you've gathered and gained to be able to articulate in in such precise ways that have been impactful. Before I move on, I want to 
ask you a little bit more about how, you know, you grew up in Detroit, you spend a lot of time in Oakland. How did, how did Oakland become a, you know, listeners, just as part of the background for this, Dariq and I are both Stanford alumni, and we recently ran into each other at the Black Alumni Summit in Washington, D.C., which was a phenomenal experience, I think, for everyone who was there, Dorika speaking on, she's a, she is a speaker. She was, she gave one of our, our version of TED Talks. And so I couldn't pass up the opportunity to invite her, especially now, because we've just celebrated Juneteenth. And, and so how did you come to be living and working and playing where you live? So you work and play in two different places. So tell us more about that. So why the where for you? Well, the where actually, uh, the why actually was very personal. So Mm -hmm. I was dating someone in the Bay who went to Stanford as well. We had a child together. And at the time I was doing nonprofit work in Detroit. And I always thought that I was going to, you know, be the mayor, the youngest mayor of Detroit. I always felt that even from my days at Stanford, that I was going to go home to Detroit. This was just part of what it means to come from a community and not just a family or not just this individual framework. And some of the research we did at Stanford is that low income students are more likely to think about themselves as responsible to their community. At Mm -hmm. Stanford, they're more likely to do community service. Right. And so I always thought like that. And so when I got pregnant, um, one of my mentors in Detroit, I've been working on arts and community and youth development. And one of my mentors, I was so like, oh, no, this is not, you know, the vision that I have for myself because he was in the Bay. And um, she said to me, you're so silly. Your community is so much bigger than the place you grew up. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And Oakland has so many similarities to Detroit. And Mm -hmm. I had lived in the Bay because of Stanford. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. And I came to Oakland and I did sort of fall in love with both the similarities and the contrast to the Bay. And pretty early I got actively involved in some really powerful youth development work. So I worked for Girls Incorporated. I led an arts and community development. And then I I was in, I was a trainer for a youth development organization, which is how I actually got into training. And then I be, encountered Leadership Excellence, which, you know, I still think is one of the most phenomenal um, organizations for Black youth in the world. Uh, their model is led by Dr. Sean Jenright, and it is just a really phenomenal resource. He practices radical healing, and it's a it's a much bigger idea of what Black youth need. And I'll just tell you one of the things he says that I love. People always talk about resilience and resiliency theory and how important it is for youth development. But Sean said, because he's such a social justice-minded person, he said, Resilience is like telling Black youth that they have a foot on their neck and they should get a stronger neck, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wow. And that's that organization had so much social justice. So that was my yes to the Bay is that combination of Black youth development, but the social justice frame. I mean, you know, for someone like me, you know, being in the home of the Panthers and all of those things was just like, how could I resist? And it was a really multicultural place. Plus I had all my Stanford connections. So that was a big part of the why and the why and the what for me. The Virgin Islands is a a much more, I think, even profound step. I had an empty nest. I had been divorced. All my kids are in college. And it was just, what is, what does it look like to have radical Mm -hmm. Mm self-care? You know, I love the water. I love the heat. And truthfully, we were in the midst of that horrible election in 2020. And George Floyd had been murdered in late May, and my business, Inclusion Design Group, had taken off in terms of this corporate stuff. Right. Because it was the pandemic, everything was virtual. Right. 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 But because of what was happening in the election and in the country and the despair around relate relations, I grew up in a Black environment, right, where like every mayor I ever had growing up was Black Poor people, middle class, very rich people were black. I had a black dentist. It was just, you know, I just grew up with black people. You might get harassed, but it was never going to be because you were black. And so I just couldn't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I wanted to live in the blackest place that didn't have snow, but I had to choose the U.S. because people were getting locked out of the country during the pandemic. Right. 
right? right? And I was right, like, right, you yeah. didn't have to have a passport to get to the Virgin Islands. So this is my pronouncement. This is the blackest place in the U.S. that doesn't have snow. Right. Um, so that was that was actually how I came here. Why I stayed is in part something really simple. I have one of the most beautiful views I've ever seen in my life. Oh wow! And it brings me so much peace. And I have decided whether it is the Lake Merritt or a a pond, I have to be able to see water from my home for the rest of my life because it brings me peace. And that's radical self-care for me. Nice. Nice. I love it. That is, I mean, I love how you thought about it and it's true. Like, so a lot of the conversations that I have with my guests have to do with how do you land somewhere else? You know, is it visas? Is it, path, you know, residency requirements and all those things. So it's really interesting to hear the easiest. It's very easy. People don't often think that it's easy to be in the Virgin Islands and be in the U.S. So tell us a little bit more about how you actually landed, you know, in terms of identifying a place where you wanted to be, like, especially in the pandemic. So traveling there, finding a place, getting your getting your landing there. Yeah, that was really interesting because what happened is I quit my job at Stanford January 9th, 2020, with the intention of taking a year to travel. I was going to go to Ghana. I was Mm going to go to to, um, Bali. I had like my business partner lives in Spain. I had all I had it all mapped out of the things Mm -hmm. I uh, and obviously 2020 wasn't the best year to travel the world. Right. So I had sold everything. You know, I had been living at Palo Alto. I sold everything and I was moving and I hadn't, you know, I was just going to be a nomad. I was like, I'm going to be a guest room surfer. I, you know, so <laughs> uh, that's why I told all my Stanford friends, just prepare your guest room. And then I moved back to the Bay because I didn't want to be away from my family, my doctor, everything that I knew during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But it was just I had so much restlessness. It was just Mm -hmm. not the right. And, you know, and then the Bay exploded after George Floyd was murdered. And Mm -hmm. so it was just I was I felt like I didn't know which way to turn. And once I was able to work virtually, then it was like, okay, where do I want to be? And I had gone on a Blue Note jazz cruise in January when I was traveling that mm-hmm. stopped in the Virgin Islands. And I met a woman from the Bay who had an um, Airbnb here. So I came to visit during the election and I, li- I stayed at a resort and I literally didn't know who won for like two or three days because I wouldn't let anybody tell me. And people who saw me were like, you are the happiest person I've ever seen on vacation in my life. <laughs> ocean, <laughs> hands up, nest tea plunge, Calgon, take me away. And that was just, then I came back with my daughter for New Year's Eve. And I was like, you need to come with me, blah, blah, blah. And I was, we were here for two weeks. She went back and I never went back. Oh. And how I found my actual place is a woman who worked at the pool bar. When I said, I, I think I want to stay. Do you know any place? She drove me up to this. And she said, I, I have some friends who had a place, somebody moving out. I don't know what the condition is. She drove me up the mountain to where I live. I live at the top of the hill, big hill, I'll say. And before I got out the car, I said, I'll take it. As soon as I saw the view. And she was like, you don't know how much it is. I was like, I don't care. I had been living in the Bay. I had been living in Palo Alto. I was like, I don't care. You haven't seen it. I was like, I don't care. If this is what I'm going to see out my window, I'll take it. And I've been here for the last 18 months. Wow. That's a great story. Like a wonderful story. That's exciting. And it's inspiring. Most definitely. I love that you just never left. <laughs> I, was, I had to have somebody bring me my clothes because I was holding on to this spot. I was like, I am not leaving. Let me get myself established. Right, 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 right. Okay. 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 So you left Stanford. You quit your job, you left Stanford, and then you were building a business. So tell us about how the Inclusion Design Group became your 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 latest endeavor and how, how partnership and, and just kind of building a new business has been in the last year. Wow. Actually, we started while I was still at Stanford. So okay. I had been doing consulting for a number of years. And in 2018, 19, I... I talked to a friend of mine and I said, listen, I really need help with the booking part of this. I'm, I hate email. This is really, I'm missing stuff. Can you help me? And she said, yes. And as it grew, I, there was a time where I was speaking in Singapore and I was trying to figure out how to get back to work on Monday. And I was like, okay, this is crazy. This is not the life that I want to live. So I decided to quit my job. And 
I cannot tell you the people who advised me not to quit my job at Stanford. It was just like intense pressure and fear. It took me another like six months to quit because mentors, you know, I won't name, called me at seven o'clock in the morning and was like, it is one thing to say you work at Stanford. It's an entirely different thing to say you used to work there. Like I was like, I can come back. And mentors at Stanford were like out of sight, out of mind. And I just never respond well to fear. Mm. I just don't. And mm-hmm. so at the point at which I was making through consulting almost as much as I was making in Stanford, not quite as much, I was like, okay, I'm going to take this big leap. The Big Leap uh, by Gay Hendricks is my favorite book. I give it to everyone. I have like 10 copies. And I'm going to take the big leap. And I've quit at least three jobs because of this book. And other mm. people quit their jobs. My boss at Stanford quit her job. And everybody was like, why? And she was like, ask Dorica. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, who's one of the best boss, the best boss I've ever had. So anyway, I tell long stories. I talk for a living. So and I preach. So you have to tell you know, just mildly interject when you want me to wrap up. No uh, so the business kind of floundered a little bit to when the pandemic started, mm. because everyone was telling us, you know, when we come back, when we come back, when we come back, because we had been mm. doing all in person. Mm-hmm. And my business partner is just like the calmest person in the world, which is so good because we are we balance each other. And she was like, don't worry about it. We still got contracts from last year, blah, 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 blah. And then George Floyd was killed. Mm. And mm-hmm. within a week, I was we went well within that next nine months, we went from 19 companies to 94. Wow. Wow. And I was getting calls at 8 p.m from CEOs who wanted me to speak to the entire company at 8 a.m. the next morning because Twitter was like blowing people out of the water Mm -hmm. for like surface, not making a comment, for making surface comments, for not making an investment. Like it was, and people were panicked. Like, what do we do? We have to budget money. We have to do things. And I had built a reputation from the work I had done at Stanford and at LinkedIn. At Stanford, when I ran the diversity inclusion office, we serviced 30,000 students staff, faculty, and alum. So I had built this, my first corporate gig back in like 2017, 2018 was because a student who had been at group com went to work at LinkedIn and there and was like, you have to bring her and that just snowballed into a very large contract where we training people all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of how that evolved. And wow. uh, you know, of course, the, there's a big expansion and now people are kind of like, oh, there's blowback and people are. But I will say that a lot of our clients are just getting more serious because they're like, OK, we can't just do this surface thing of Black History Month speaker sure. and Juneteenth and all of that. So sure. that's a good thing. Sure, sure, sure. So you business blew up in the in the, the heat of, you know, summer of 2020, 2021, mm-hmm. 2020, right? 20. Yeah, it was it's he was killed May 27th, 2020. Yeah. So in that summer, everything blew up. And then now we're two years later. What are you seeing as, you know, the progress that you've been able to make with companies? So what are what are companies? So there then it was like fires, like we want to put out fires, you know, and then so I'm assuming you created plans and processes with all of these clients that are a little bit more substantial, a little bit more meaningful. So what are you seeing now in terms of how your clients are evolving in in, in the work that they're doing and how new clients are are evolving into adopting and taking you on as a consultant? We have significantly fewer fewer clients because not everyone was growing and developing. Well, for two reasons. Not everyone was growing and developing. Not everyone could afford us, Mm -hmm. and which was fine, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was a point at which I was doing three workshops a day virtually. Wow. And But I sort of felt like, you know, my friends in the movement are getting tear gassed. Right. Mm-hmm. The least I can do is sit in front of my computer and try to fight what I call the inside outside game. Mm-hmm. Right. And I had mm-hmm. access and I didn't feel like I could just turn away from it. And sure. it was lucrative, which actually made me feel guilty. But um, so but the shift is for two reasons. I Well, the two or three reasons. Some people were really just one off in the first place. Some people couldn't afford us. And other people actually began to build internal systems. Mm. Right? They mm-hmm. hired DEI leads. They expanded their staff who was um, who did learning and development internally anyway to have people who could specifically do DEI and the IBE work and all of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jedi, like there's all these. Wait, wait, what is what are the OK? So give okay, us a tutorial. So there's a. Uh, 
DNI was the first thing, diversity okay. and inclusion. Then it was DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. Uh, there was we used a lot DIBE, which is diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. And there's a little dance metaphor that we use for that. I can share okay. it if we have time. And then JEDI was coined by social justice folks, and it was justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Mm. Um, and so we try not to get too caught up in the words. We get really caught up in the work. Um, but right. we have a cute little D-I-B-E metaphor <laughs> to help people understand why we what we mean by the words we use, which is way more important. I tell people you can Google a bunch of definitions if you want, but I'm not interested in definitions. I'm interested in conversations, because if right. we don't talk about what we mean when we say these words, they're yeah. meaningless. Right. right. So it's the work that we're interested in, whatever you call it. So. And our core clients, the ones we invest in deeper partnerships with, are thinking about how to do the work at all of those levels. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I'll, uh, if, do we have time for me to tell you a little metaphor? Because that's how the work. Yes, please. Okay. Please. So, this was actually con- coined first by Verne Myers, and then we expanded it. You may have heard it. Diversity is being invited to the dance, mm-hmm. inclusion is being asked to dance, belonging is being able to dance how you want. And equity is having a turn picking the DJ, right? Mm. And what we mean by that is, you know, this recruiting stuff, recruiting and hiring is cool. But if you get people in the door and you don't have inclusion practices, you won't keep them. And we see that in a lot of companies. They're able to recruit and then people they can't retain. Yeah. Right. And belonging is about assimilation whether I have to act like my boss or senior leaders in order to advance. Can I dance my own dance? Can I wear, you know, my natural hair? Can I speak my native language, right? In an office where they have English and they have, you know, Mandarin, do I have to speak English, right? And so those are big things that come up. And then equity, what we like to say is just because people feel good doesn't mean they get paid the same. Mm -hmm. So we also Mm -hmm. have to look at systems, right? Can Mm -hmm. I write my pronouns on a form? Are there bathrooms for me? Can I breastfeed, right? Like, are there things that are in place in the system Mm -hmm. that actually are built in, you know, pay, you know, equity, uh, looking at, you know, systems for promotions, who gets mentors and sponsors, all of those things that translate to the the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And also what you do externally, Right. Are you involved or who are your suppliers? Do you look at diversity in terms of who are suppliers for your company? There's a lot on the equity and increasingly on the corporate social responsibility side. So. Right, 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 right. So so I'm curious then, how do you measure impact? <laughs> oh, this is such a big question in the field. Another yeah. Stanford alum, Lily Zhang, who um, has always been just a intellectual peer, but also critic of my work and other work in the field. Lily wrote, uh, so we talk about, well, we'll get into mindset in a little bit, but we have a, a model and part of it when I was at Stanford, especially was talking about creating spaces that are safe and brave. And Lily wrote an article in the Stanford Daily that was called Why Your Brave Space Sucks. And um, Lily is a trans Asian woman. I think they're using they them pronouns these days. And I hired uh, them back when they were her. I hired them. And uh, because I was like, I want to have the intellectual discourse, right? right? I run a diversity and inclusion office. I want to have trans folks here. I want to have people who are critical of the model. And that's just always been me. Like, I believe in intellectual discourse. And I think it's what's wrong is that we no longer actually want to listen yeah. to people who have different beliefs than us. We think, you know, what is it? You know, we, we treat people like they're traitors if they switch their positions, if they're flip flopping. And it's like, no, this is actual what communication and conversation should look like. Mm -hmm. Lily and so many other people now are focused on evaluation in the field. Lily went on to graduate. I hired them as a professional, but now they're huge, you know, following Mm -hmm. rights for a Harvard Business Review, all of the things. And they have a book coming out in the fall that is going to be an excoriation of the field. And their philosophy is really about evaluation. You have to be able to document and demonstrate very specifically how your interventions work. 
Mm. And I hear that and I believe in that, but I've always been a little bit skeptical of evaluation because I worked in youth development. And what that often looked like is people external to our community coming Mm -hmm. in and saying that what we did have no value because they couldn't measure it. Right. Right. And we were operating from a place of love in our children. And Mm -hmm. I started doing youth development with arts. And I remember back in the early 90s or mid 90s, there was this article that the National Endowment for the Arts put out called Measuring Joy. Mm. It was just about the recognition that there are things you do for people that matter that aren't can't always be measured. Mm. I think DEI work should be measured, but I don't think that's the only thing that's happening. And what you know, I discussed with Lily is there are ideas like intersectionality, like critical race theory, and you can't prove right? That these ideas have impact, but we know they do, right? And I and my company are very focused on both ideas and then helping people translate how to put those ideas in action. We do a a survey for everything that we do Mm -hmm. and we get great results. People say they're going to use the work. What we haven't done is longitudinal studies to say uh, five years from now, has this made a difference? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there's this theory that has been out for a long time that training doesn't work, not just diversity training, you know, HR, any kind of training, right, doesn't work, management training. And there's been research to show that it doesn't. But even when Lily and I first started, what we acknowledged at that time is it's not that diversity training doesn't work. It's that bad diversity training doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And I pride mm-hmm. ourselves on having a model um, that's based in research that makes a difference to the people that we serve. But sometimes I think that difference is in ideas and it mm-hmm. may be less tangible than the researchers and statistician, statisticians want. But when our clients talk back to us, they talk about the radical impact it had from on CEOs to frontline workers. Mm-hmm. And I also know that after George Floyd, there was, I don't know, a hundred billion dollars pledged for investment in black communities, 100 billion. And, you know, not all of it has been realized. A lot of it was over 10 years, but like, you know, and, you know, there are things like having Juneteenth off, which is certainly questionable in terms of its effectiveness, but there's also a hundred million dollars invested in black banks. There's also um, media creation for black folks. There's tons of things that have happened because of activism. And it's not always, you know, measurement is not sufficient. It's necessary, Mm -hmm. but insufficient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I tend to agree with that being an education in Africa, Mm -hmm. because every funder wants to know, how do you measure impact? How do you Mm -hmm. this, that, the other? And it's, um, there are certain, particularly for children, there are certain quality of life things that are very hard to, you know, to measure in numbers and all of those things. So I I hear you on that. And and I think it's something that we'll see. I mean, the the longitudinal is in some respects, social media, it mm-hmm. is the the new reporters that people are on themselves. You know, we'll see what the impact is 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 from there. Yeah. How do you, how do you measure a child feeling loved? Right. Exactly. Right. And and, no. and, and, <laughs> yeah. and you don't know until you see an adult who is a empath empathetic mm-hmm. person, right? Mm-hmm. So we can't really know until we see for years from now that this has actually been something that has changed who this person may have been, despite what may have been going on in their environments. And all the other measures fail. The standardized test, like right. I used to say, we uh, one of the organizations I work for used to talk about youth development as the big lie, because mm-hmm. you're asking us in an hour and a half after school to accomplish what the school isn't c- accomplishing in eight hours a day. Mm-hmm. We got to reduce truancy, increase grades, you know, change attitudes. School has eight hours. We got an hour and a half. And this is the big lie you had to tell the funders is that I'm going to solve all these problems in an after school program. Right. Right. And I just don't do the big lie because it's I know it's a lie, but it doesn't mean the work doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. I had Mm -hmm. kids come to me who couldn't read. I didn't teach them to read, but they went. I have a student in particular who disappeared and had been involved in gangs before we met him. This, this story always makes me cry. And I was terrified. I was looking for him. Did he go back to the street? Blah, blah, blah. He showed up in my office with a cap and gown picture of him having gotten his GED because I told him, look, it's great that you in community and we love you, but you can't sleep on my floor. 
you can't sleep in this office. You're going to have to get your life together. And I didn't I didn't prep him for the GED, but you ask him what difference we made in his life. Mm. And it was mm-hmm. believing in him and having the idea for him that you can do more. Right. right? How do you right. measure that? You right. Can't. Right. Right. So I know what that does. Yeah. 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 That's that's awesome. That's going to do it for part one of my conversation with Dorica Blackman. Thanks for joining us. And as always, you can catch us each and every Tuesday with new episodes at GlocalCitizensPod.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Do us a favor, share, subscribe, tell a friend, leave a review. It helps people find great content on every platform. Be sure to join us next week for part two of my conversation with Dorica, where she talked a little bit more about her work in the U.S. and abroad, as well as the Dorica that's not in the workspace. Thanks again. And until next time, bye for now.